Right after Pearl Harbor, the Japs grabbed up most of the islands in the Pacific. At Guadalcanal, we learned how to fight the Jap. And he learned that we were coming back. At New Georgia, it took us a bit longer, but we learned a lot more. At New Britain, we beat the Jap at jungle fighting. Macon Atoll brought us into the Gilberts. Tarawa was fast and tough and expensive. Kwajalein was next. It gave us control of the marshals. We were halfway back. And a Weetok made veterans of us all. Now we were ready to smash at Japan's front door, the Marianas Islands. Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. D-Day, the battle for the Marianas. LSTs unload their Amtraks. We attack again. A joint assault force of Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Saipan. Nothing can stop the Amtraks, except a direct hit. Driving in. One of our planes is hit. Jet fire pins us down. across the beach. The Jap throws everything he has at us. Many of us are hit. Even the wounded carry on. We secure our first foothold in the Marianas. Another D-Day. To the south, another joint assault force smashes at Guam. Guard gets us through heavy enemy fire. Guam is American ground. The first piece of territory the Jap took from us. We're taking it back. flag is planted again on Guam. It has a special meaning for every one of us. On Saipan, we strike for our first objectives. Tank and infantry teams push inland.
push on to the Jap air base. Aslito Field. Precision bombing and shelling before D-Day wrecked the hangars and buildings but saved the runways. Now we can use ground-based fighters and bombers. The Nips got out in such a hurry, we captured many of their planes undamaged. This Zero was caught in its revetment. With the Aslito Field secure, we head north through the cane fields. We hack through the hills and underbrush day after day, taking with us only the most important things, weapons. One night, they massed their tanks and counterattacked. This is what happened to all their tanks. The Japs knocked out one of ours. Those are the Japs. The Navy's big guns keep hammering away. When this Jap ammunition dump blew up, it shook the whole island. Flamethrowers move up. Heavy enemy fire is coming from those caves. out of their pillboxes. The fight is on for Garapan, capital of the Marianas. Army artillery goes into action. time we shelled Tinian Island across the channel from Saipan. When we take Tinian we get the biggest airfield of the Marianas. The battle for Garapan and Mount Tapacho goes on 24 hours a day. Tank runs interference while we evacuate our wounded under heavy jet fire. <laughs> Snipers have to be cleaned out. We use rockets. Smoke them out with incendiaries. We take.
take a jet prisoner. The battle from inside a tank. Lieutenant General Holland Smith, U.S. Marine Corps, commanding the assault forces. Another Jap oil dump goes up. Thunderbolts take off from our new field. We blast the Jap command post overlooking Tanapag Harbor. Bomb Jap strong points in the hills. The Japs bring down another one of our planes. Garapan. Now it's house to house fighting. They're waiting behind hedges, underneath buildings, behind walls, everywhere. 37s are used to knock them out of their emplacements. Jap makes a run for it. Garapan is ours. Japs fall back slowly. going in the hills. Tracers find their gun positions. We corner them on the north end of the island. Loudspeakers are broken out and a friendly native broadcasts an appeal for them to surrender. We hold our fire. We wait. Many civilians do surrender.
They set up community kitchens and make rice balls. For those who refuse to surrender, Final cleanup is on. Our front line advances. has burned out. We reduce a bunker. Some try to escape by swimming. Hand grenades are effective. They take up positions in the cliffs. We have to pick them off one by one. Some choose suicide by jumping. Others surrender. And some fight until the end. Buried our dead. Four thousand four hundred and seventy. Connor, Vandermeer, Schultz, Levine, Kalafatich, Smith, Olson.
This is my hometown. It's called Youngstown, and it's in the state of Ohio near the Pennsylvania boundary. In Youngstown, we make steel. We make steel and talk steel. I guess it's the same in Sheffield, England, or that place the Russians built in the Urals, Magnitogorsk. I'd like to tell you something about how we make steel here, and while I'm at it, introduce you to some friends of mine who work in the mills. Look down any street in town, and you'll see the mills at the end of it. There are 25 miles of them along the Mahoning River, and today they're busy day and night. Every eight hours, the shifts change. 15,000 men to the shift. The men going to work can see the freight trains bringing in the raw materials, iron ore, coal, and limestone. This is the ore. It looks like dirt, but in a few weeks it'll become part of a ship, a tank, or a gun. And in peacetime, an office building, a bridge, or a dam structure. An overhead crane picks it up and carries it over to the skip hoists, which take it up to the top of the blast furnace. In the blast furnace, the boys smelt the ore into iron, the first step in making steel. The molten iron comes out at 3,300 degrees. The slag comes up to the top like cream in a pitcher and goes out the other way. Johnny Chonko on the snort valve controlling the blast. When things get too hot, he's got to think quick and move quicker. Peter Zeman's the blower, head man on the shift. He tells him when it's time to stop the flow. And this is Frank Mele, a friend of mine. Frank came here from Italy 45 years ago. He's got his own place up on the hill. Come Christmas, it's full up with his children and grandchildren. Frank doesn't talk much, but I know how he feels about his home, his kids, and the satisfaction he gets knowing they'll grow up with the same chance as the kids next door, or any other kids in the country. This is the open hearth where the molten iron from the blast furnace is mixed with scrap iron and the two purified into steel. I remember the first time I saw it, the size of the place, the noise, the sirens wailing when the big stuff moved overhead, and the heat hitting you like a solid wall. It's something you don't forget. These 
boys are slagging, lining a furnace with dolomite. This protects the wall of the furnace against the extreme temperature. Down the line, Bob Wentworth is charging scrap iron, scrap that came from farms, backyards, and attics all over the country, collected by school kids and housewives to do their part in the war. Next door, Tommy Hughes is giving one of the furnaces a drink of hot iron from the 35-ton ladle. This iron is fresh from the blast furnace. These are the foremen, Bill Riley and John Strauss. John came here from Croatia. He's got two sons. The older is a captain in the army. The younger, Ed, is still in high school. He's a substitute on the football team. Next year, when he gets a little more beef on him, he'll be a regular. it isn't all football. Education comes first. The principal, Mr. Glasgow, understands the kids. He believes they should help plan their own schooling. Ed's interested in flying, so along with languages and literature, he gets courses in physics and aerology and internal combustion engines. It means a lot to have free education like this for your kids. If you listen in on these youngsters, of course you'll hear them talk about football and dances and things of that sort, but you'll hear other things too. Talk about what kind of a world this can be after the war, things maybe their parents didn't talk about enough. They know what's going on, these kids, and that's all to the good. Yes, if you listen to them, you get to appreciate how much democracy depends on education. Education for everybody. In the open hearth, the steel's nearly finished. The first and second helpers take a sample. Mike Kubinski's the first, Earl Strong is his assistant. Mike's people came here from Czechoslovakia. Earl's ancestors came from England in the 17th century, when there wasn't much to America but a few colonial villages along the coast. By inspecting samples of the molten steel, the boys can tell exactly when the furnace should be tapped. Earl's a musician. He plays bull fiddle with the Youngstown Symphony Orchestra. No professionals here. They're all steel workers and their wives and daughters. Maestro, Michael Ficocelli, is a timekeeper in the mills, and there's been plenty of bad jokes about that. rehearsing a piece by Gerald Meyerovich, a Youngstown boy who's in the Navy now.
steel men get in the habit of doing things together, like in the mill. The open hearth gang ravels out the hole in the rear of the furnace and lets the steel out, roaring and spitting at 3,000 degrees. The pit gang dumps in alloys to give it the special qualities they want in this batch. This ladle weighs a hundred tons, but the overhead crane handles it like a toy. Lifts it over to a line of ingot molds where it's tapped off. We call this teaming. Just to be on the safe side, another test is made to be sure that the alloys have been added in proper amounts. The ingots are carried over to the blooming mill where they get their first shaping. It looks rough, but these rollers squeeze the ingots down to a tolerance of a sixteenth of an inch. George Bannon and Clarence Kinney control the operation from the pulpit. They've been doing this together for so long, they work like one man with four hands. When the ingots flatten to a slab, Fred Ingram takes over. He cuts a slab with hydraulic shears under many tons of pressure. Fred's a shop steward for the union, which has an agreement with the mill. He represents the workers on the plant's labor management committee. These days, they're discussing production problems, and they've been doing a great job up there, working together, planning together, figuring out new ways to make more steel. We've got the machines, like this one in the hot strip mill, where in one continuous operation, a slab of steel is flattened into a sheet. Each roller operates at a different speed, synchronized to handle a slab that's growing longer and thinner and moving faster all the way down the line. This is it, steel. Only a few hours ago, it was iron ore. Now it's finished and on its way to become a part of the new world it's building. We've proved we can lick production problems. We've got the equipment, the science, everything it takes to get the job done. But when the war is over, we're going to have other problems. We know about that in Youngstown. We've had it here before. There were times when there was no smoke in the sky. The mills were quiet. The street full of men, angry, questioning, wondering. We're beginning to understand that these things don't just happen in one place, they happen everywhere. We're thinking that all this production all over the world that's doing such a job in a war can do a job in peace too, if we can just learn to work together. And I guess we're beginning to learn.
The battlefields of America are the production lines. The sweat and muscle and brains of men and women pounding out the tools of victory, slugging out more and more and more, twisting the axis into a trembling question mark. Men and women, million strong, fighting over here. But over the vast expanse of the interior American front, there are critical industrial areas. Areas with production schedules unfilled or threatening to be unfilled because of labor shortages. A mighty industrial program moving faster and faster. Labor supply to match it lagging behind. A question mark of our own how to make them balance without lowering the production goal. All over the land, these critical areas of manpower shortage, victory shortage, areas of concentrated war industries charged with the duty of turning out more and more and more. Here in these vital areas, crisis. The program must be met. Labor supply must be found. Let's take a look at one American community, one of many, and watch it face its problem. Dayton, Ohio, home of Wright Field, the Air Force's Material Command Headquarters, and Patterson Field, Air Service Command Headquarters. City of phenomenal employment rise. Statistics for Americans. Population 1941, 210,000. 1943, 275,000. Industrial employment, 1941, 58,000. 1943, 118,000, more than double. Statistics for Nazis and Japs. Time fuses, aircraft instruments, machine guns, precision optics, carbines, tank tracks, searchlights. Yes, let's look at Dayton. On April 7th, 1943, a meeting of 200 leading citizens is called. Speaking at the moment, is Mr. S.C. Allen, president of the National Cash Register Company. In Dayton today, there is grave danger that our war production goals in this area may fall short of achievement because of manpower difficulties. Briefly, under present conditions, the number of people available for war work does not meet the industrial demand. Consequently, Dayton has been classified as a Group 1 critical area. Word reaches us that the war procurement agencies may be forced to transfer work elsewhere in order to be assured of meeting production schedules. It was not necessary that conditions in Dayton reach this serious state. We neglected the essential adjustments of the community to altered circumstances and emergencies of war. But it is not too late. Much of immediate and future importance is at stake. Our responsibility to the war needs of the nation our responsibility to the people of Dayton that their new war problems are met through wartime measures. This is a job which Dayton itself must face. It cannot be done for us by Washington or by official edict or by waiting and hoping. It must be accomplished by local leadership and local action. It is our responsibility. Out of this meeting grows another. Men designating themselves an emergency committee aptly chosen name, representatives of labor, the CIO, the AF of L, representatives of government, area director of the War Manpower Commission, deputy regional director of that agency, the chief of program requirements for the region, leading industrialists, leading retailers, the city's mayor, the Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce, the Commanding Generals of Wright and Patterson Fields. Men representing every interest in community life, convinced that within the community itself are the resources necessary to fulfill Dayton's war activities. Vices and studies of the War Manpower Commission and its local area War Manpower Committee make it perfectly clear that there are three sound ways of meeting this situation. First, we must find more war workers from within Dayton itself, from people working in non-essential jobs and from people not working at all. Second, 
If we utilize our present labor force to the fullest, our anticipated labor requirements will be reduced. Third, local conditions must be conducive to retaining the labor we have. More labor from within the community, full utilization of the labor we have, retention of the labor we have. These are the answers, not one of them, but all of them. That is the general basis on which we must work out a detailed program. Dayton's last monthly report of estimated labor requirements showed the apparent need of thousands of more workers flowing into the city, drawn from beyond Dayton's boundaries. In the future, as in the recent past, all roads, all signs would point, all wheels would roll to Dayton. But a community like a paper bag blown too full of air must burst. Dayton is crammed, jammed, up to its neck, over its ears. Every living facility taxed, a city coming out at the scene. The job of the emergency committee was to strengthen the existing War Manpower Commission program by guaranteeing the effective support of every element of the community. Around another table, the local management labor committee, in Dayton it's called the Dayton War Manpower Committee, was joined by members of the emergency committee and drew up their plans. They posed this consideration. The threatened deficiency could be overcome. With a fuller utilization of present manpower, with recruitment of more local manpower, labor supply could meet the demand. Precise information was lacking on many aspects of the employment situation. Therefore, an inquiry went out to all manufacturers hiring eight people or more, to the personnel offices of the airfields, to all retailers. All recognized the importance of their individual cooperation. They provided a foundation for the whole program. Self-imposed ceilings of employment, ceilings representing absolute minimum labor requirements, and signed agreements not to break through those ceilings. They analyzed their estimates of future labor needs to see where they could be cut by more efficient use of every man hour, where requirements could be met in other ways than an increase of workers. The war employers pledged in writing not to increase employment levels above the revised figures. Retailers were to cut back to their 1940 employment levels, and the signed pledges went out to the War Manpower Commission. Thus, a community stopgap, an industrial tourniquet. War Manpower Commission, Washington, D.C. Revised estimates of increases in date and employment for one year from May 1st show reduction 18,394 as compared with March 1st estimate. Marion A. Gregg, Area Director. Yes, community action was taking effect. The survey had brought out important facts. 6,000 jobs held by men could be done by women. Industry had opened a host of jobs available for women in Dayton now. On the strength of this, a woman's committee walked the streets and knocked on the doors. Every woman in 3,000 Dayton homes was interviewed. Did you know there are all sorts of interesting war jobs open for women right away? Three women on your block say they'd get a war job if their neighbor did. How about you? Some answered yes, some no, some maybe. On a poll sampling basis, 10,000 said they were available. 7,000 said yes, part-time. 9,000 said maybe. Most of those who said maybe had a reason. But the community knew about that, was planning to meet that. Eleven day nurseries, more to follow. Here, women can leave their children while they work, confident of the best of care in the most pleasant of surroundings. More statistics for Americans. The more day nurseries, the more women for war work, the less labor shortage. Mm -hmm. 
With sufficient child care nurseries as their answer to women with small children, Dayton's Emergency Committee and its local Management Labor Committee went to work. They were determined no woman should cash a check, board a bus, see a movie, or walk down the street without getting acquainted with the idea that she was needed. Each week they printed a pamphlet called The War Worker. This listed all jobs open to women and men, from assistant chemists to machine operators to lens grinders to conductorettes. And if a woman went into a bank, a woman stepped into a grocery, if a girl hopped a bus, if a girl went to the theater, she bumped into the war worker. Every medium of publicity was used. Motion pictures were made of Dayton women at work in war factories. These films were shown in Dayton theaters, wedged in between features and shorts. Dayton women are marching to war. Women are driving the buses that carry war workers to their jobs. Women are doing their part in keeping wartime Dayton supplied with clean laundry. Women are preparing and serving the food for the hungry war workers. Yes, in every essential wartime activity, in the factories and at the airfields, Dayton women are helping to keep the wheels of industry turning. And hundreds of these women have never worked before at such jobs. But the War Manpower Commission says at least 12,000 more Dayton women are needed to fill the shoes of the men who have gone to war. The Dayton radio stations took their mics to the assembly lines and interviewed the women, young and old, who were fighting on the production battlefields of America. Tell me, Mrs. Bradley, how do you like working in a factory? Well, right now, there isn't anything I'd like better. How does your husband feel about it? He feels fine about it. Every evening when I come home, I get an extra kiss. And all over the city, new eye marks of a community at war. Every month, 36 billboards, which used to prate of nylon and bedroom slippers and lingerie, now spoke another language. Advertisements popped up in the papers. Dayton women had gone to war before, but now 700 women a month, not normally in the labor market, are applying for war jobs. Dayton was finding a new pride in itself. The prestige of war work was being hammered home. Women who went out to fight on the production lines were gaining the city's respect. So did Dayton's program get underway. The community had begun to search out undeveloped sources of labor supply. Workers are being hired for what they can contribute, not disqualified because of irrelevant infirmities. Here in Dayton, deaf mutes cleaning segments of bifocal lenses. Blind workers, crippled workers, older workers, part-time workers from hitherto unthought of groups. In Dayton, many members of the Junior Association of Commerce marched to the USES and volunteered for four hours of part-time work every day. High school schedules were rearranged for students who would take part-time jobs. Yes, people from within Dayton are being enlisted. The Employment Stabilization Plan of the War Manpower Commission had been in operation since the beginning of the year. New controls have been added. All male workers clear through the United States Employment Service. Certain occupations are reserved for women alone. Free movement from less essential to essential employment is being encouraged. Many hands in the community are transferring from peacetime luxury work to wartime critical work. And as with the other groups acquiring a sense of community responsibility, here labor played its full share, gave its wholehearted cooperation and to forestall indecision, to bring the employment office to the prospective worker, representatives of plants on the priority list moved into the USES and hired applicants right on the spot. Some measures designed to find workers, some to utilize, some to retain, some common to all three. Common to all workers is the sheer matter of how to live in a community. 
In Dayton, it was found that 100,000 war workers had only three hours a week to shop. Thus, other hours that should have been spent at work were taken off to obtain the very necessities of life. With people not in war work having the advantage of regular shopping hours, a blow was being given to the morale of war workers, to the importance of war work. Dayton faced this with courage and aggressive leadership. To gain full support for the war manpower program, the emergency committee did a little explaining, a little cajoling, a little persuading. Yes, this is now Dayton on a Monday night or a Wednesday night. A one-shift town adjusting itself to a three-shift tempo. The retail stores are open. The five and ten is open. The markets are open. The department stores are open. Retailers are able to hire high school girls working part-time as sales ladies, thus finding it easier to go back to their 1940 employment levels. With no inconvenience to the stores, essential shopping needs of the community are being met. The banks are open. Some companies send groups of late shift workers down in buses to cash their checks. And girls who had no time for permanence, unless they took time off from work, are now being made beautiful at night. That goes for the men, too. And there's the important item of recreation and relaxation. Entertainment of the men on the fighting front is a must for fighting morale. It's been found true back home. In the movies and bowling alleys and special dances, at odd hours for odd shifts, a potential is recaptured and built up. A potential of ultimate production back at the workbenches. The sheer matter of where to live presents a formidable problem in Dayton. Rooms, beds, floor space, all jam-packed, overflowing. The housing problem is aided greatly by the regulation of in-migration. But with insufficient quarters for many already in the city, housing projects are keeping pace with the rest of the emergency program. Priorities are being speeded up, and the city is dotted with various stages of housing construction. Large projects, temporary as well as permanent, for white and color. People in Dayton are opening their homes to war workers. Buildings are being converted for their use. There's still a housing problem, but it's being licked. War industry cities are war crowded cities in many ways. The sheer business of how to get places, the sheer discomfort, prevented many people in Dayton from entering the labor market. The community and the airfields faced this bugaboo along with the others. To combat it, industrial plants organized share the ride movement. New loading platforms were built. Shelters were built over the old platforms. New buses were obtained and added to regular schedules. There's still a transportation problem, but it's being licked. Along with the improvement of community service facilities for war workers, there is improvement of plant facilities. The factories are perpetual motion machines in Dayton. They're running round the clock. The workers are coming in and going out in an endless stream, living days endlessly the same. Dayton industrialists did some thinking about that. Some of them had for a long time. They had found there were simple ways to lower absenteeism and prevent turnover. Indeed, to stimulate even further the get a war job spirit of the city. A cafeteria so that men and women can have hot meals on the spot. One of them even has a cafeteria with an exclusive touch. And a lot of Dayton women who were undecided about war work made up their minds when they heard about this. It's recognized that the efficiency of people is unlike the efficiency of machines. And it's been found that they work harder and produce more if they have a chance to lean back and stop working now and then. 
occasional rest periods, giving a man a chance to have a smoke or eat an apple. As simple a thing as that. In many plants, there are minor medical treatments available over and above emergency aid, and a dentist with full equipment. These sort of services save many a worker a half day off. More ways of forestalling that half day off. A group of personal services for the people in the plants, at the plants. All of these tend to more complete realization of the workers' productivity, to induce more members of the city to go to work, to retain workers in their jobs. An important element of this last is the exit interview provided for by the Employment Stabilization Plan. Here, the personnel representative of one of the plants and a worker are sitting down and talking it out. A sympathetic interest in the reasons prompting the decision to quit more often than not results in a decision to remain and contributes to better job relations. One shift comes out and another goes in in Dayton. The black of night is punctuated by the blue-white blaze of the factories. Inside, as in the day, men and women are manning the production line. And inside, more plans for increasing the efficiency of those men and women. Here at night and during their regular working hours, a class is being trained in the particular skills which they require at their jobs. The WMC's Training Within Industry program is an integral part of Dayton's formula. Thus, Dayton is facing its present and its future with full speed ahead on any and every aspect of manpower. With the cooperation of the radio and the newspapers, the city has become manpower conscious, and no manpower event occurs without finding its way into the press. The local management labor committee and the emergency committee have taken off their coats and gone to work, and are discovering the truth of their original contention. The answer is not just more workers, the answer is something like this. model town, no panaceas, no permanent solution, but a movement, a common effort, a community at war. So let's take a look at another meeting of the emergency committee just four months later. Dayton has partially solved her manpower problem. It also means that war production schedules in this area are no longer threatened by labor shortages. This was our goal and we may well feel proud of its achievement. The whole community participated, but we know such a program does not result from a general spontaneous action. It can only take bold form through direct activity of top local leadership. It cannot be delegated. We also know such groups as ours cannot do the entire job. Our effectiveness derives from the support and cooperation which we give to the War Manpower Commission and the other appropriate governmental agencies which must carry the burden of making these programs work. We know our job is not finished. War problems are never fully solved. Our work must continue unrelaxed. We will not fail if we observe the fundamental lesson of our recent experience. War production is human production, the product of the minds, bodies, and spirit of the people. If those persons responsible for production would only spend as much time on human relations as they do on the mechanics of production. Our manpower problems would be well on their way to solution. The way of life of people in the community, as well as in the factory, cannot be separated from their capacity to produce. All over the land, areas of labor shortages. Cities with problems like data. Cities with problems peculiar to themselves all with problems they can overcome by aggressive leadership, local leadership. Communities at war, 
pounding out the deadly weapons of victory. Communities at war, all of them confronted with these words, the words of a great American soldier. This is a hard war, a bitter, bloody war. Make no mistake, our men know it and are ready for it. But they want to be assured above all else that the home front is behind them. 